So for this and, and other reasons, uh, researchers have been turning to molecular biology and genomics as a way to, to study MDS. Um, and um, one thing that's known fairly well about MDS is that chromosome aberrations um, are well known to be implicated in the disease process. So um, cytogenetics, for example, 50% of patients will have some form of um, chromosome aberrations that can be picked up using metaphase cytogenetics. So looking at, um, as an example, um, looking at um, genotype poly genetic polymorphisms or SNPs is a, a very sort of uh, fruitful way to think about attacking this, this problem. And um, we have a group over now at the Cancer Center who have been studying um, MDS um, by looking at um, SNP data uh, that I've been working at with. And um, they were very interested in, in, in um, using random forest to, um, to study mm -hmm. this, this disease. So what we thought we would try to do is um, using some type of SNP data to generate um, a SNP signature which um, could classify accurately an MDS patient from a control patient. And um, so they, they have collected some, uh, some data on this using um, the new Affymetrix SNP arrays. Uh, these are the 6.0 arrays. Um, very high resolution SNP ar uh, arrays which have something like over 900,000 SNP calls uh, per individual. So these are the variables in the model. Um, so as you can imagine with, with um, 900,000 variables, this is you know, like a massively high dimensional problem. And so to try to develop a classifier with 900,000 variables is, is really going to be um, you know, very challenging to conventional methods. Um, but at the same time, um, it also uh, poses a problem to even sophisticated machine learning methods. So even uh, without some form of, of dimension reduction, even methods like random forest and other machine learning methods, it's not going to be possible to do accurate variable selection. And in fact, um, as I get into it a little bit more in my slides, um, I'll sort of talk about the, the trade-off between P and N that's needed to be able to do accurate variable selection. So the first thing I did when I got this data was to uh, reduce the dimensionality to about 5,000 uh, SNPs using, um, you know, univariate p-values with um, a fairly liberal p-value thresholding um, value. So this gave me um, a training data set of about 2,400 patients of which um, 181 were um, MDS patients. Now this may actually look like a small number, but this is a fairly rare disease. Um, in the US, the incidence rate is probably about 10 to 20,000 per year. Um, however, um, because the, um, the class frequencies are, are so unbalanced, you have to be a little bit careful, okay? So if you, if you grow a tree or if you grow a forest, a multi-class forest, um, on, multi on multi-class data where the class labels are unbalanced, what happens is that the tree growing process is completely dominated by the majority class label. And the prediction error is driven by that, and VIMP is driven by that. So if you want to be able to sort of identify important variables, you have to take that into account. And one technique that, that works really well is to use balanced subsampling. So rather than actually using all the data where you have uh, you know, a majority of the data is, is from controls. What I did was I actually used balanced subsampling where I would randomly select from the controls um, the same sample size as from the MDS patient population to, to create a balanced data set, okay? So I did this 1,000 times. For each of these data sets, I grew a classification forest. Um, Oh yeah, one more thing. Um, so in, in growing this, uh, in, in, in doing each analysis, I also reduced the SNPs further. So from the 5,000 SNPs, I actually took 10% of these SNPs in each analysis. Again, this has to do with um, the size of N, the sample size related to the dimensionality P. Okay, so from each of these 1,000 analyses, you get um, a VIMP for each variable, which you can then rank. And what I did was I just kept the top SNPs um, the top 200 SNPs as ranked by the average FIM. Once this was done, um, we, we extracted a fresh te test data set. So this is based on the same platform, but from a different institute, actually from a different country, with um, similar sample sizes in the cases in the controls, okay? 
So, um, so here are the results. And um, what I'm showing you here is the, the top 100 SNPs. The blue curve um, is random forest, the red curve is GLM, which is logistic regression in this case. So we're looking at MDS versus controls. Um, and what I did was I fit a, um, a forest sequentially. So based on the first top SNP, based on the, set, uh, the first top two SNPs, and then the first top three SNPs and so forth, all the way up to 100. And then I did the same thing for GLM. Um, so that's the number of SNPs on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the test set area under the curve. Okay, so you can construct an ROC curve and you can compute the area under the curve. And this is test set based because the forest was calculated on our original training learning data set, but now it's tested on this new institutional data. So you see some very interesting things. Um, first of all, the, um, the area under the curve increases, but you know, not really rapidly, it takes some time. In fact, if you run this thing out to 200 SNPs, which were the number we kept, you could get the area under the curve to 97%. Not bad. Um, the other thing is um, GLM does a decent job, but eventually it kind of seems to take a hit and it never seems to recover. And, and my reason for, for using GLM was really one, one, one reason only, and that was I wanted to see if there was some sort of interaction going on between the SNPs, right? Since the GLM here is only based on an additive model, this would be a way to see if SNPs were somehow interacting independent, uh, sort of uh, acting in an um, interactive way. Um, although that may be a little bit confounded with the fact that because this is GLM MLE based, there could be issues about, um, you know, uh, parameter estimation. I still think that, you know, it's, it's very interesting that the, the difference in the areas under the curve, um, you can see that there's, there may be something at, at play. Um, so the large number of SNPs here, I think, is, is interesting as well. Um, the fact that you kind of have to run out to 200 SNPs to get a really good area under the curve um, kind of matches the, the diversity that we see in the clinical data. Okay. Um, oh, one other thing. So this was very interesting. So I learned something very interesting about the Bayes classifier in this problem. So on the y-axis, um, what I've plotted here is the, um, the out-of-bag prediction. So this is the, the probability that a patient is uh, MDS. And to do this, what I, what I did was I took the, the test data set and the 200 SNPs that we identified and constructed a forest on the test data and I used the um, out-of-bag data to compute the, the uh, predicted probabilities. And what you can see here is that 50%, which is the threshold for defining the Bayes rule, right? If, if the predicted probability is over 50%, you vote for disease. Otherwise, you vote for not disease. So you get a blue or red point. But these are actually the true class labels. And as you can see, you get very good separation. Um, and then I noticed the same thing on the training data set, that when I was doing this, that um, I was getting very good misclassification error rates. But when I took the forest constructed on the training data and I computed it on the test data, I was getting very poor misclassification error rates. And I realized why, because this has to do with the Bayes rule. So over here are the predicted probabilities for the forest grown on the training data and then tested and then compute on the testing data. And what you can see is that the predicted probabilities are shrunk much more towards zero. So here's the Bayes rule, right? So the Bayes rule would say, well, everything over here has got to be blue, and everything over here has got to be red, but 50% is far too high. You'd probably do much better over here near 30% or 35%. In fact, when I saw this, I realized that really mis misclassification error rates and using Bayes rules could be very deceptive in these multi-class problems where you have different frequencies for class labels. That the best thing to do is to look at the ROC curve. And from there, you know, depending on what your sensitivity and specificity needs are, then define your, your classifier. Okay, so um, now I kind of, I want to start moving into um, some of the new ideas that we have about variable selection. And this was um, something that we published recently in JASA Theory and Methods. Um, and um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different way of, of sort of doing variable selection. For the, the most important thing that, 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 that makes it different than VIMP is that it's not prediction error based. Yet at the same time, the idea sort of is trying to get at the same concept that VIMP is trying to get at, which is that because of the greedy um, splitting nature of the tree, the 
where a variable splits is very informative about how predictive and how useful that variable is, okay? So it's all about real estate, the position of a variable in a tree. Let me, let me explain this a little bit more. Um, so uh, this is a survival tree. I've inverted it now. So this is the root node. Um, and so it's a survival tree based on some uh, stress test data that we collected from heart failure patients. Um, so the minimal depth is really sort of the distance from the root node to the first time that uh, the tree splits on the variable of interest, okay? And to make this um, sort of precise, we, we, we define what we call a maximal subtree. So it's the biggest tree such that that tree root node is split on that variable. So the root node in this case is split at exercise time and um, its maximal subtree is the root, is the whole tree itself, right? So that's the first time that exer exercise time is split and the distance from this to the root node is zero. So it has a depth of zero. So small values indicate a variable which is very important. Uh, another example is peak VO2, so peak um, oxygen consumption. Um, you can see two maximal subtrees, one red over here and one red sort of in the middle. Um, this is the first time that this subtree splits. It has a depth of one. And this is the first time that this subtree splits, splits on peak VO2 and it has a depth of three. So what's the closest distance to the root node? One. Right? So they can have several maximal subtrees for a variable. So the closest one to the root node tells you the minimal depth. It, I mean, in a nutshell, it's, it's like a first order statistic. The closer you are to the root node, the more informative. And that's what VIP is trying to do, right? Because by noising up a variable, you're sort of sending a, a data point to a terminal node far from its original assignment. So it's all about positioning in the tree. Okay, so what are the advantages of doing this? I think one, uh, one uh, immediate advantage is that it's um, independent of the prediction error. Okay, so um, this can have some, some very useful advantages. One uh, good example is survival analysis where um, there's some controversy about what's a good uh, way to actually measure prediction error. So some people say that using Harrell's concordance index is a good technique. Others will argue that the Breyer score is, is, is useful. Um, another reason that you may want to sort of get away from thinking about prediction error is that there are scenarios where it's not even clear exactly how to measure prediction error. For, for example, in um, competing risks where you have multiple events um, that you're looking at, what is the event that you should focus on? Since you could have prediction error for all the events, which one should you focus on? And as we start to get into more and more complex outcomes, mixed outcomes where uh, instead of looking at an outcome with one dimension, let's say we're looking at D dimensions. We have continuous values, survival values, um, multi-class data, uh, whatever. Uh, what is the prediction error? Which outcome should I look at? So as soon as you start to distance yourself away from prediction error, you can start to think about force in a very general framework, a, a variable selection with force in a very general framework. 